All right, all right. So I think we need the, we are ready for our next speaker. So let's just give last seconds for people to join. Oh, okay, yeah, great. All right, perfect. So, Stefan, yes. welcome, first of all. And uh, yeah, there's no further delay. Like, tell us, what will, what will we be talking about today? We will be talking about domain-driven design, which has mm -hmm. nothing to do with web design, as we heard about earlier. Yeah. Uh, it's about, well, it's maybe not even about code, but I'm, I'll get back to that later. OK, perfect. So I, like, I will just leave stage to you and uh, very much looking forward to the uh, fascinating uh, presentation of yours. OK, well, thank you. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, domain-driven design, uh, which is a very broad topic. People wrote a lot of big books about it. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the basics. There's a lot more than what I, I will be talking about, but that won't fit in an hour. I probably need a whole day for that. Uh, and I'm not going to do that. I don't want to bother you with that too much. Um, so first, let me tell a bit, little bit about myself. My name is Stefan Koopmanschap. I'm from the Netherlands. I've been a software developer for over 25 years now. Um, and I've mostly been working with PHP with a lot of open source projects. And now this is the point where everyone stands up and leaves because I don't work with Drupal. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I've worked on, on a lot of different projects with different types of software, with different frameworks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I've worked in a lot of different ways. And is anyone able to guess who I am on this picture? Probably not. Most of you don't even know me for that long. That's me over there. Um, yeah, and I've been working. Recently, in uh, the recent years, I've been working on, on a couple of projects where they were using domain-driven design, and I became convinced that this is something uh, interesting that we should use more often. Um, so let's talk about the... Oh, before we start, let's, let's do a check first. How many of you are developers? Most of you. Okay, that's good. Anyone that didn't raise their hand, what are you? Project managers, okay, now th this is good actually. This is, because this is a topic that project managers or product owners or whatever you want to call it, scrum masters, should know about as well. Uh, so let's talk about uh, domain-driven design. Um, it's become a lot more popular in, in recent years among uh, IT companies and uh, I'm, I own my own company called Ingewikkeld and I come into companies to help them out with their projects uh, and yeah, so, a lot of companies have different ways of doing software development. Let's just put it as generic as possible, um, which includes uh, uh, gathering uh, uh, the, the uh, spec specifications, then building everything, and then testing everything, and then delivering it to the customer in one way or another. Um, and domain-driven design, uh, uh, while I was preparing this talk, I was like, okay, there is so much, what should I be talking about? Uh, uh, but bit by bit, piece by piece, I found, okay, there is, there is some interesting stuff that people should talk about and that a lot of people don't really think about at first because a lot of people think about, when they think about domain-driven design, they think about code. They think about code structure and stuff like that, but there is much more to it. So um, I've made a selection of topics, and, and uh, most of it is actually not about code. So um, that is what I want to really start with. Domain-driven design is not about software development. Well, sort of it is, of course, because it stems from software development. But it is about more than just the software. It is, more, it is about more than just developing software. Um, and that's, that's also why that, that third word in there, design, it's not about web design, it's about the design of your architecture, about the design of your code, and not really about the actual code that you're writing. So of course, 
Once you start with domain-driven design, uh, some of the stuff will trickle down into your code, some of those concepts, but uh, um, uh, most of it is, at least most of what I will be talking about today, is not really about the code itself. Um, but I think most of you are developers, that it is important as a developer to understand about this. Um, so domain-driven design was first introduced by Eric Evans. Well, first introduced, they were already using it for a while. Eric Evans was the one that said, this is interesting, I should write a book about that. And that's when people started learning about this term called domain-driven design. The blue book, that was the book where it all started. Yeah, the actual title is Domain-Driven Design, Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. And that complexity doesn't really need to be code. Um, so he describes uh, basically a way of modeling. He, he had been working on a lot of big, complex projects, and he had learned a lot about how to model your, your code and how to model your software. And uh, that's what he basically put down in this book. Um, and the problem with this book is it's very intimidating and very dry to read. So if you start reading that book, it will take you a long time to finish it, if you ever finish it. Uh, to be fair, I never finished it. Um, and I'm not the only one that's, that thinks so. There were a lot of people that thought so. And at some point, uh, there was someone called Von Vernon, and he said, well, maybe we should make a bit more practical book because blue is about the theory. So then the red book came out. Von Vernon wrote the red book and uh, it, this is called implementing domain driven design. So that already tells you a bit more about, okay, this is actually about implementing stuff. It's a bit more practical. Um, eventually he also wrote another book called the green book because the cover is green. Um, you might see <laughs> some, some patterns here, um, which is called Domain Driven Design Distilled, which is a bit thinner. Um, I've not read it yet myself, uh, but I've heard a lot of mixed reviews about it. Some people think, oh, this is great because it's a great introduction, and other people think this is a bit confusing because there's a lot of information not really there. Um, what I always say, what I always recommend is get the red book, read the red book. That's the book that will give you the best introduction. And if you have the opportunity, buy the blue book, but just as a reference, because the red book is referring to a lot of terms that the blue book explains about what, what, it, what it is about. So if, if when you're done with this session, after this session, you want to start reading something about domain-driven design, get that red book. So, um, domain-driven design comes from a background of complex software. Uh, and that also means that if you're building uh, a simple website for uh, the baker around the corner, then you probably don't want to use domain-driven design. There's a big chance that that will be complete overkill. But once you're starting to build more complex websites or web applications, uh, which, you know, I prefer Symfony, but if you work a lot with Drupal, you can do a lot of complex stuff with that as well, then it would be interesting to at least read up on domain-driven design. It's basically just like Scrum. You can use all of Scrum if you want to, but you could also pick and choose some elements from Scrum. The same goes with domain-driven design. There's a lot of concepts in there that you can also use outside of the context of a full domain-driven design uh, uh, project. So if anyone comes to me and says, do, you, do I need to use domain-driven design? I answer with the, the perfect question to any technology question, and that is, it depends. Now, um, I started with uh, uh, the, the saying, by default, domain-driven design is not really about the software itself. Um, and I've worked a lot, it, as I said, over 25 years now in development. Uh, and there's one thing that's been a bigger problem than all the architecture problems, all the coding problems that I've encountered, anything else. And that is communication. Communication is the single biggest problem in software development projects, at least in my experience. 
Um, and this is where domain-driven design can actually help you a bit because it gives you some things that you can hold on to to improve that communication. Um, so one reason why communication is a problem in software development projects is because we're developers, and as developers, we always think in our own words, our technical jargon. We talk about controllers and models and, and uh, MVC and, uh, you know, stuff like that, um, services. Um, and we, we always have a better name than, our, than the users because the users are just stupid users. They don't know what they're talking about, right? Um, well, to be fair, they do know what they're talking about because they are the users. Uh, so we need to listen to them a bit more, and th this is where domain-driven design can actually come in and help you. Um, if, if you have um, uh, an e-commerce website, for instance, and um, uh, as developers we talk about the checkout step of the whole process, because that's the word that we always use, but the, the business that we are developing for are not talking about the checkout step, they're talking about the personal information step. You get a disconnect between the developers and the actual people that use the system. So this is where we need to listen to our users. And this is why domain-driven design says there is one thing very important uh, to, basically as a first step when you start uh, uh, writing software, or start a new software development project, and that is uh, to define the ubiquitous language. The ubiquitous language is basically, this word has this meaning, and it has always has this meaning, and this is where you listen to your users, because the words they are using is what basically makes that software eventually. Uh, and if the users don't understand what you are talking about because you use different words, it's never gonna be good software. So, yeah, listen to your users. That, that's basically the message that I want to get across. Um, another thing that is interesting about ubiquitous language is that as a developer, we learn more about the actual domain of the software that we are building. Instead of just writing code, we actually learn about what are the problems that we are solving. How are we supposed to do that? Um, by, by listening to the users explain about what they are doing, how their process works, what they want, uh, you learn more about, okay, this is, this is actually the problem that we are solving. It's not that problem that we thought we were solving, it's this problem. So, I've used the term domain already a couple of times. Hell, it's called domain-driven design. Uh, let's have a look at what is domain-driven design, uh, or what is the domain, basically. Um, the domain is one of the words from the ubiquitous language of DDD itself. This is the official uh, Eric Evans definition. It's a sphere of knowledge, influence, or activity. The subject area to which the user applies a, a program is the domain of the software. Yeah. Basically, what it means is whatever the user does and how the user calls it, that's the domain. Um, so, if, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're working on that uh, e-commerce application or you're working on, on uh, uh, the administrative side, the, the accounting side uh, of that same company, uh, you may have different words or the same word that has a different meaning between those different contexts, the, the shop itself or the accounting department. Um, so that also means that your domain can actually uh, have different meanings. So you have to find a way of creating context. Um, so you can create a domain which is called the, the, the storefront and a domain which is called the accounting department. Uh, you can also have underneath the storefront different subdomains to create a bit more context for a specific part of your application. Um, so if your full domain is a web shop and, and you have the accounting department as well and, and you have the storefront, uh, then a word may have a different meaning here than it has over there. 
Now, there is another way of structuring within your subdomain, and that's called a bounded context. A bounded context is basically um, if you have uh, a, an actual physical store, then you have uh, the computer department over there and the groceries department over there. These are different bounded contexts. They have their own employees, the, the IT department that know about IT stuff, and, and the groceries department has their own employees that, that know about grocery stuff? I don't know. Um, so that's different bounded contexts, and they are basically their own islands within your domain. Um, and they usually don't talk to each other a lot. Um, so let's take that web shop again. Here uh, I have a domain called the web shop, which is the whole thing. That's a domain. But within that domain, we have two different domains, products and checkout. And then I, I created some bounded context here called cart and payment within the checkout domain. Um, on the one hand, creating a structure like this will help you understand what part of the application you're working on. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to add too many layers. Otherwise, it's going to be really, really complex to understand, okay, what context am I working in right now? Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> it's a fine line. Again, I, I cannot tell you the one silver bullet about how to do that. It depends. So let's get back to bounded context and how, how you can have different meanings for different words. Um, if you have a, a definition of a payment uh, in the bounded context of the, the checkout, then what do you want to know about the payment? I, I don't want to know from which bank account the payment was made. I don't want to know if they used a credit card or a debit card or uh, in, in the Netherlands we have ideal. Um, I just want to know basically about the payment. Was it successful? That's about it. That's, that's all I need in the checkout flow. Uh, now, going back to that accounting department, they do want to know what, what is the bank account, what is the information for this person, because we need to create an invoice and send them an invoice. Uh, how, what amount was paid and, and is that correct amount? Uh, was there a discount? Things like that. So they need to know a lot more about that same payment. So it doesn't really make sense to create one object called a payment that has all that information that we really don't need in the context of the checkout. So it's okay to have multiple different objects for a payment that basically represent the same payment. They just expose different information. Um, if, if you want to, uh, to, to make it a bit more clear about the bounded context, uh, how you want to talk about that in terms of separation, I, I said before the, 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 I, the, the computer department or the IT department and the grocery department, they don't really talk a lot to each other. Um, if, if I talk a bit more into uh, technical terms, uh, you could see it as, uh, for instance, uh, different, if you have a service-oriented architecture, which is really hot, right, um, then you could see that every bounded context is a different service in that service-oriented architecture. So the only way they talk to each other is through a formal API, and they don't use each other's code or uh, concepts beside that. Um, yeah, I don't want to go into the discussion about whether service-oriented architecture is good or not. It depends. Um, okay, uh, let's back up again. Uh, we've heard about the domain. We've heard about the bounded context. Uh, we've heard about the ubiquitous language, which is really important. Uh, how do we determine that language, the, the boundaries between the context, etc.? Uh, now, in the, this, this book, the blue book, uh, Eric Evans introduces a concept which I really hadn't thought about before reading this, uh, which is called modeling out loud, which is basically talk to people, which is scary for some developers, I know, but it's really important. Um, the, uh, the, the idea is that when people um, talk about a concept or talk about a definition, they use different words than when they write it down or when they type it. And that when, when you do that in a conversation, then other people also chime in. Oh, but I think this is different. I think it should be this and that. 
And if you then listen to each other and make sure that there is a consensus about what is a, a payment or what is a checkout, uh, eventually you'll get to the point where you understand, okay, this is what a checkout is within this context. Um, so let people talk about it, and don't let people talk about it just once. Uh, it's okay to say, okay, now we have this definition, is that, uh, is that okay? Is that the right definition? Uh, because people will always speak up and say, hmm, I think maybe it should be a bit more different. So do use two or maybe three rounds to get to the definition of, of well, a specific term, and then move on to the next term. Um, there is a lot more ways, of course, to, to do this, but this is one that I really liked from the Boo Book uh, uh, to do that. Um, then another way, but more, it's, it's, well, you can also define terms in this way, but there, it's also about the process, finding, understanding the process, is to do event storming. Now, event storming is a, a concept that a lot of people talk about that uh, basically connected to a domain-driven design, but it is not part of domain-driven design. It's just something that a lot of people that do DDD use to determine how a certain process works and what terms are, are the right terms to use. Um, Alberto uh, Brandolini introduced that, wrote a book about it, and uh, it basically what it is is um, you get together with a group of people, uh, the users preferably, and also some developers, and you use stickies on a wall to, to define certain points in the process, certain decisions that are made, certain events that happen, uh, input that comes in, and by in that way you start understanding more about what is the, the actual problem that we are solving, what do we need to implement uh, in our software. Um, so again, it, it's not part of DDD, but it is something that a lot of people use, and you can use this outside of DDD as well, which is great. Um, now, before we actually move to solving a problem, um, and of course we are developers, so we solve those problems with all the fancy technology that we can, we, that we can find, uh, we need to do one more thing uh, to give us a, just a bit more clarity, and that's make a map. Uh, the map uh, gives us an overview of the different bounded contexts that we have, and how these bounded contexts talk to each other, uh, so that we, we understand what is actually happening. Now, if you uh, build a brand new piece of software that there was nothing before this, then it's a map of where you want to go. But if you are replacing existing software, or if you are refactoring existing software, then it's uh, basically the, the, the rule that you start with a map of the current situation. How is it right now? And then, of course, you can create a map of where you want to go so that you have an idea of how, how to get there. Um, so, for instance, I have a, a, the, the product display uh, bounded context, I have a shopping cart bounded context, the checkout bounded context, and the inventory bounded context. Now, product display talks to shopping cart because when I click on add to cart on my product page, then the cart needs to know that that product was added to the cart. Um, then at some point, I want to conclude my order, so the shopping cart talks to checkout to say, here, this is the cart, and this user now wants to check out uh, this order. And then checkout needs to update our inventory because there were some products that were bought, uh, so it needs to know that those are not available anymore to, to someone else. But uh, maybe, maybe, on the product display, we also want to show how many of this product are currently in stock. So maybe the uh, product display also needs to talk to the inventory. And actually, shopping cart might also need to talk to the inventory because we might want to block users from buying certain products if someone else just ordered the last one. That saves us a lot of refunds. How do I found out, find out if we should use that, if we should do that? Uh, Talk to the organization, talk to the users, make sure that what do, do they want, and then build what they want. Um, now, in this process, again, it's, it's very important not to make any assumptions. There is a saying about that, which I'm not going to say on stage. Um, but uh, if there is anything unclear, talk to the people that know, 
the domain experts. They should help you decide how to solve a certain problem if something is unclear. So what we've done so far has nothing to do with actual code. We've basically just made a specification. We've determined what words to use and how to structure uh, everything and which processes we have. Uh, and now, uh, maybe now is the time to start writing some code. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you again. Because I want to talk a bit more about uh, the basically the level of detail. Um, so far, we, we mostly talked about the big picture, the web shop and the product display and, and things like that. Um, to understand the processes that we need to implement in our software or that needs to happen, we can do an event storming session, uh, we can do other sessions, we can organize everything to, to gather all this information. Um, but there are some specific things, part of the ubiquitous language of DDD, uh, that we need to define. Um, and that is, for instance, a domain event. A domain event is something that happens. So, for instance, uh, if we uh, have the web shop and we add a product to the cart, then we, uh, it's not really that readable, but uh, then we have an event called product added to cart. It's always past tense. Product added to cart. Then we have an aggregate, and an aggregate is basically a, a, a collection of related domain objects, domain models, um, that, that should be treated as, as a single unit. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say an order. Because an order has, uh, has order lines, it has a payment related to it, and, but it makes no sense to fetch just one order line. That order line is always part of the order. And that payment, it doesn't really make sense to just get that payment because what do I need to do, do with that? It's always part of that order. Um, so the aggregate is basically a collection of objects that, that belong together. Then there's the, the command, and a command triggers an event. We, we had the uh, added to cart, product added to cart event earlier. The command would, could be create order or add to cart. So the command always triggers an event, or could even trigger multiple events that can be handled uh, synchronously, but could also be handled asynchronously, depending on what you are doing. So uh, the process of modeling this and, and determining uh, what is important, uh, that's basically what we've been doing so far. Um, there's also some other things that you need to define that I won't touch on now, not that much. Uh, there's actors, the users that actually do something. Um, uh, there's uh, uh, business processes, uh, something, you know, a command is, is done, is executed, and then that triggers something, a process. Uh, uh, external systems that you need to interact with, that uh, you need to de determine all of that. Um, so, using all of that, you can create a whole flow for the whole process or you could zoom in on a specific part of the process and then in more detail determine what happens there. Um, and while I was preparing this talk, um, uh, I was discussing some of the things that I was trying to get across, and a colleague of mine basically said, um, you know, talking about all of this, is software development just an implementation detail? Which yes, actually it is. The actual software that we write is just the implementation of a process, of a problem that we want to solve. So Jaap, yes, he, he is right. He is actually right. Software development is just an implementation detail. So let's have a look at a bit of an implement implementation. Um, we, we've, we've got our events, our aggregate, and, and stuff like that. Um, and um, I don't know how many of you have worked with Doctrine as a database layer. A couple of hands. Um, there's a lot of you know, similar libraries, and they all use some terms that domain-driven design also uses, but they're slightly different. So that can be a bit confusing when you start working with domain-driven design. Um, in some ORMs, uh, uh, we are used to having entities, and entities are basically classes that reflect the structure of the database. Uh, 
uh, uh, so it, one entity equals one table in the database. And uh, it has properties, and those properties are basically the fields in the database. Um, now, in, in domain-driven design, it is important not to think about where you store your data and how that is, is structured. It is, in domain-driven design, it is all about the domain, about how the users think. And yes, that could map directly to a database, but that's not what we need to think about in, in that phase of determining what, how we structure basically our, our domain. Um, so uh, uh, if, you, if you create your code then, uh, uh, or if you create your domain, I should say, then don't yet think about how are we going to store this? Is this going to go into a relational database or a document database or some other solution, XML? Uh, don't think Arnaud was a fan of that. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, and a great example of something that is not an entity but still holds some data is a value object. And a value object is uh, basically, uh, it represents something, a concept, such as a moment in time. Uh, a moment in time could, could just have a date, but it could also have a date and, and a time. And the time could be hours and minutes and also seconds maybe. Uh, it could maybe also, depending on what you're working on, have a, a, a time zone, things like that. So you could have one object that rep re represents that moment in time. And as long as you always, for, for a date or a date time, you always use that value object, you always know what you're gonna get, what information is in there, and what, you, what can you get out of that. Um, another great example is uh, a name, the name of a person. There's a lot of different ways to write names. In the Netherlands, we have a first name and a last name, but sometimes also an infix something which I think Americans don't really do. If you ha you're named uh, uh, Van something, then, it's, then it's, there's no space in between. But in the Netherlands, we have the space in between. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that you could also have in a name, such as a title. Someone is an engineer or uh, a professor or something, they have a title. Um, other people, well, this is someone that has a title. It's Sir Ian McKellen. The Sir is part of that name when you reference Sir Ian McKellen. Uh, so if you use a value object for something like this and then you always know, okay, all these parts that I need are in there and I can use that. And I can have uh, formatting methods on my value object for different situations. Uh, sometimes you, uh, you want uh, uh, a person's initials and their last name, but not their full first name. Sometimes you need the full first name. So you can make different formatting functions depending on what you need. Now, of course, both the entities and the value objects should, in, in terms of naming, should always use the ubiquitous language. Use the terms that the organization that you're building this for is using so that everyone knows what we're talking about. So uh, if I look at this a bit more practical, uh, because uh, it can be a, a big overkill to have a, 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 a database entity uh, and also a domain entity and then maybe a value object and, and, and another object for one thing. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. If you are in a big enterprise type and they have unlimited money, uh, I, I used to work for, uh, as, a, as an external developer, I used to work for, let's say, a big airport near Amsterdam, and uh, they have a lot of money, or had at least. Um, this was pre-COVID. Uh, they had a lot of money, so they could spend uh, a lot of time on, on things like domain-driven design. So then it's okay to separate, fully separate your, your domain code from your, from your actual implementation database code, infrastructure code. Um, but there's also ways to, to slightly defer that, because your domain could also just, or, uh, just define an interface. 
And as long as your database entities implement that interface, then you at least know this is the API. The domain de determines the, API, the, the code API for these objects. And then it could be Doctrine or Propel or um, Eloquent for Laravel. Uh, it could be objects from, from that. As long as they implement this API, then they adhere to what the domain states that should happen. Uh, of course, there is a bit of a risk that you're accidentally using uh, infrastructure functionality in your domain code. So you need to really pay attention to that you only use the, 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 the functionality that was de de defined in the, in the interface. Now, um, a lot of the, the business logic that you write can be uh, tied to your, your, your domain objects, uh, but sometimes there's something that happens that basically uh, does different or multiple things, and that cannot be really linked to one domain object, and that's where uh, DDD comes up with the term uh, services. Uh, Services, if you've used uh, Symfony, for instance, then a service is basically any class. Um, this is a bit more specific, so I, I, uh, yeah, I have a hard time with, with calling it a service, but that's, that's what they define <laughs> it to be. Um, so a service is uh, a piece of code that can maybe do, do multiple things at the same time. Um, if, if you, uh, so I'm used to Symfony structure, right? I, I don't really know how Drupal does this. In the Symfony, you have the source directory, and then if you have any services, then you have a services directory, basically, in a namespace, and that's where you put your classes. Um, but if you look at the code base as a new developer, and you see a services directory, do you have any idea what happens there? Could be anything, right? So, uh, I would say uh, uh, think about the structure a bit more and, and use the terms that you, you found while you know, doing the specifications determining ubiquitous language. Uh, so if I have, uh, uh, I don't know, a special service that uh, needs to be called uh, to process an order because it, uh, it determines if the payment was done. It, it, it also connects to the accounting API uh, because they need some information, and, and et cetera, et cetera. It does a couple of things. Uh, then I could have an order processing service. So I could put that in the service directory and service namespace, but I could also put that in an order processing directory and an order processing namespace. So if a new developer comes in and they look at the code base, they immediately see, oh, this is about order processing. That's great. So now I know that if I need to change something in the order processing, I need to go there. And then you could call it the, the order processing service, but really service doesn't mean that much. So you could also call the class, name the class, the order processor. It's, it's almost the same thing, but the service is, it doesn't tell us anything. So why use that? Now, uh, we defined also domain events earlier. Uh, how can we incorporate those? Uh, well, most popular frameworks, and I, I think Drupal as well, has, has like an event system where you can trigger events and then you can have listeners somewhere else that listen to those events and, and can do something when that event is triggered. So if we, if we have our order processor, um, when, when we send the, the order to the external accounting uh, system, uh, then we could have an order sent to accounting event. And then we could have a listener in a completely different bounded context that needs to do something, listen to that event, and do whatever it needs to do once it, is being, uh, it has been sent to, to accounting. Um, and the great thing about that is that, uh, I said earlier, you don't really want to cross the boundaries of those bounded contexts too much in terms of calling each other's code, you want to formalize that communication. Events is a great way to do that. You can have the event being triggered in one bounded context and then have another bounded context listen to that event and do whatever it needs to do. So this is a great way of making, bridging basically that, that gap. Um, now we talked about entities and then the confusion that sometimes happens and, and, and the same for services and uh, there's, there's another term that in ORM context means slightly different 
something slightly different than in, in domain-driven design, and that's repositories. Um, in an ORM context, the repository is basically everything you need to access the database uh, yeah, itself. Um, and uh, so a repository is meant to fetch data, but a lot of users, because uh, it also usually has the connection, use the, the repository also to store data back into the database. Um, now, you, you might want to separate the storing part from, from the reading part. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and that's basically what domain-driven design says, the repository is just for fetching information, getting information out, and not really for storing information back in. Uh, you want to separate that a bit. If you want to dive more into that, check out CQRS, which is more about those, that separation. Um, and uh, so in DDD, the repository is responsible for loading domain objects, domain entities. Uh, so it could fetch it from the database, it could fetch it from uh, Elasticsearch or uh, uh, some cache somewhere, uh, but your, your domain code doesn't really care about that, it just talks to the repository to get that information out. Um, and one thing is important is that uh, uh, basically repositories are basically on the same level as the aggregates that I talked about earlier. So you don't need a repository for individual order lines or you don't need a repository for the payment uh, because if you load an order, you get an order from the repository, you get the order object, including all the order lines, including the payment that is related to that, et cetera, et cetera. All the information for an order should be gotten from the order repository. Now, there's a lot more to cover about domain-driven design. Uh, I think I've covered the basics, uh, and I realize that it can be a bit overwhelming, all this information. Um, but at least you have now a, a bit of an idea about domain-driven design. Um, all of these concepts can be used basically in any piece of software. Um, it will go against the, the standard structure of a lot of software. Like, I'm, I'm used to Symfony, the default symphony structure is definitely not domain-driven design. Similar probably for, for Drupal or for WordPress or whatever framework or software that you use. But all of those usually, you, know, you, you I mean, you, you can create your own structure within your own, you know, code. Uh, so you can apply domain-driven design as well. Um, talking about code structure, uh, and I haven't really talked about it in this uh, uh, talk, but it, it is something that you might want to dive into. It's hexagonal architecture, which also, uh, which basically defines uh, a good structure of splitting up your application logic, uh, your domain logic, and your infrastructure logic, which really, really uh, uh, works well with a domain-driven design approach. Uh, so that's definitely something to look into. I mentioned CQRS already earlier about uh, uh, splitting read and write. Uh, that's definitely something to, to dig into. Um, there's, there's a lot of talks on, on YouTube, etc. although I just learned earlier that you shouldn't embed videos, so I'm not sure about YouTube. Um, but there's a lot of information about that blog posts, etc. Uh, uh, that you can, uh, can read into. Um, there's one thing that I want to, uh, let's say, warn you for a bit, and that's event sourcing. Event sourcing is great for very specific situations. And you're going to see the term event sourcing a lot in domain-driven design, um, but I would definitely not use it everywhere. Uh, the answer, of course, is it depends. Uh, and I cannot give you exact specifications on when do you want to use it and when you don't. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, no, uh, just be careful with it. Uh, I've seen applications that were fully event sourced and they ran into so much trouble. So, yeah, beware. And, well, to reiterate what I said earlier, uh, if you want to dive into DDD a bit more, get that red book and read that red book and don't start reading the whole blue book. Please don't. Um, unless you are really masochistic, then go ahead. Um, there's also some interesting information, a uh, blog post from the PHPCC, which is uh, the company that, uh, 
of, uh, among other people, Sebastian Bergman, who, who wrote PHP Unit. Um, there's uh, Matthias Nobach has some interesting uh, stuff on his blog. Um, uh, there is a, a book on, on LeanPub called uh, Domain Driven Design in PHP, which is apparently f quite good. I haven't actually <laughs> read it yet, but it's apparently quite good. Um, and, and there's some more stuff, like a podcast that I did with uh, Andreas Heigl about you know, the practicalities around domain-driven design, uh, the podcast called Ingewikkeld Sessions. Feel free to subscribe. Um, that's my promo talk. Um, and that's it. I hope this helped. Are there any questions? Yeah, it's a, that's a good good question or a good good uh, uh, an interesting issue. Um, if you if you work a lot for Dutch customers, their domain is in Dutch, but you want to write your code in English. Um, yes, I also always translate to English uh, because you never know we, uh, who what developer will be working on that code, so you do want to have it in English. Um, uh, Google Translate is my friend. <laughs> because there's a lot of terms that I have no idea what it is in English, and probably Google Translate sometimes messes up. Uh, that's, yeah. Um, the only thing you can do is uh, have some documentation somewhere about what, what the concept is that you're implementing in that code, like uh, a doc block at the top of the class, or maybe you have some documentation in, I don't know, Confluence or whatever, uh, so that you actually document what you're doing and what that represents. Yeah? Any more questions? Yeah? That's a question about the domain driven design system. Uh, yeah. Does it have any specific artifacts? Like in, in Scrum, you have the product backlog, product backlog items. Is there something similar for domain driven well, design? Yeah, you want to define your ubiquitous language. Uh, which basically is a sort of a dictionary for your project. Um, you want to document in one way or another the, the, the processes that you're implementing or the problem spaces that you found. Um, if you do uh, uh, event storming, uh, usually you have a, a big wall and a lot of stickies and you make pictures of that and then uh, at some point you have to, someone has to, like the project manager or, or whatever, has to create I don't know, user stories or tasks or whatever from that. Um, uh, so yes, you want to document, especially that, that early process of defining everything, you want to document that because that's what you need to use to, to, well, to know what you need to build in terms of software. And I reckon that uh, during the life span of a project, just like in Scrum, the domain can evolve. Oh yeah, absolutely. So what, what you often do is when you start with the big picture, uh, what processes are we, are we uh, uh, try, trying to, to digitize or uh, what problems do we try to solve? And then once you actually start, you, you don't want to do a waterfall. You don't want to define everything up front exactly. yeah. because things will change at some point. Um, so once you start working on something, then you, you, you dig deeper into that specific part that you're working on. And then you start refining that and, and getting the, the right detail for, well, for solving that problem. Uh, and then you move on to the next part. And I can also um, um, think that uh, this takes a lot of time. Eh? Yeah. Like documenting takes a lot of time. Yeah. Do you feel like you, uh, doing that uh, in the end uh, results in a better product or in less costs for the customer? Or is there always some overhead? And um, it's not a default uh, go-to approach for all projects. Is there? Is, uh, you mentioned the Amsterdam airport yep. <laughs> where you worked at. They had a lot of money, so you could you were yep. able to do this. But like in smaller projects, is it still feasible? It depends. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so again, uh, uh, you don't have to use all of domain-driven design. You can use specific elements. Uh, that already helps. Um, 
full domain-driven design is for big and complex projects. That, that's where it comes from, and that's where you want to use it. For, for you know, small or medium-sized projects, you want to pick and choose. But uh, one thing I found, I mean, uh, was what I mentioned at the start, communication is the biggest, biggest problem in any software project. If you solve that by, by get, getting clear definitions of what, what are we talking about, what are we trying to solve, uh, that helps a lot uh, when you start developing. So it's definitely worth it to at least spend some time on, on, on that part, uh, which is something that a lot of developers, including me, like to skip because we want to start coding. Uh, but this, this really helps uh, to understand what you're coding and to not have to throw away uh, big parts of your code because it's not the right solution to the problem or you didn't even know what the problem was. No more questions? Okay, I mentioned a lot of uh, uh, things that you could look at. I created a, a page, so if you make one picture of one URL, that's this one, uh, because I list there all the, the things that I mentioned, like the books and the blog posts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so you can go there and, and uh, check out more information about domain-driven design. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. It was indeed very insightful. So, yeah, absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, friends, so it's, uh, uh, it's nearly time for, uh, for our lunch break. So go enjoy yourself, refill your energy, and uh, we will see you for the uh, Q&A uh, uh, session with Dries just after lunch. <laughs>